So I think there are both obvious ways that the pandemic has changed teaching and then some less obvious ways. Um, the obvious way is, you know, online teaching is now just much uh, more of a, a part of normal teaching. We just have to know platforms. We just have to know, you know, where to direct our students, how to engage them online. Um, but some of the ways that, at least for me in my teaching, uh, the pandemic has had a less obvious effect are it's really highlighted the importance of the personal relationship in education. So I always knew in a general sense, you got to connect with your students. And in lectures, I would say like, okay, here's a personal detail or a picture of my kids, you know, this is funny or something like that. Um, but when you don't know whether you're going to be seeing a person face to face tomorrow or whether you're going to be on Zoom or one of the days when Zoom went down, we were streaming live. And so I couldn't even see them, but I could see their chat, you know, you need to know on both ends that there's a human there and that there's some sort of interaction happening, right? And so anything that I've been able to do uh, to build that human relationship with my students has just just paid off. It's just been an investment that like uh, I couldn't have better spent my time. Um, and so some things, you know, you, you think like, oh, I can give them write a lecture for like four hours, you know, invest all this time in that. Okay, like that's, that's great. Like craft your lecture, that's fine. But for me, finding creative ways of connecting with my students as humans and then making sure that those relationships are structured in the right sort of way so that we can get at the material, the content. And then for us in a philosophy course, what's really important is that we can have these dialogues, these back and forth, these conversations where we're making arguments and giving reasons and appreciating the experience of the other person, but challenging them to think harder and more critically about their assumptions, their values, their reflection, to find ways to do that, to, to sort of do that with another human. Uh, has just become the most important thing. And so that's like in my teaching, sort of a non-obvious sort of, you know, effect of the pandemic. Uh, and in practice, it actually looks kind of crazy. It's, it's sort of like, you know, the Wild West for me of teaching because you can do that in a lot of different ways. One way is using technology really creatively, making sure that you've got, uh, you know, some sort of mechanism for communicating to them that's not just, Here's an email or here's text posted on a particular site or whatever else. Um, but making sure that you're telling the story of your class almost in the way that, that a creative team has to tell the story of, you know, whatever uh, firm it works for or whatever, uh, you know, institution that it's a part of. You've got to find creative ways of getting that narrative out there. And you can't depend on being able to do it person to person every day in a particular routine. Um, so that's, that's the biggest change for me in my teaching. So one thing that really strikes me in coming into the Leighton Concert Hall and teaching every day is I have this experience, and it's similar to an experience I have when I walk into a basilica. Uh, I walk through the doors and my attention is just drawn up and then around and I sort of look at the seats and I look at the stage and it gives you a certain feel. It gives you, puts you in a certain frame of mind. Um, I think there's probably like empirical research on the way in which architecture you know, can shape our minds or shape our attitudes. And for me to be in a space that has just been like historically, um, you know, a place of creativity, a place of artistry, uh, a place where, you know, good and beautiful things have been appreciated and presented. Um, I mean, it's inspiring. I try not to let it be terrifying for me uh, because, you know, if you look at the list of people who have performed on this stage, like it's easy to think like, what am I doing here? Uh, I try to put that out of my mind uh, and just appreciate the way in which um, being in this location, in this place, um, can just give me a sense as a teacher uh, that what I'm doing is maybe not performing, but, um, you know, delivering uh, and engaging uh, my audience, my students in a particular way and letting that dynamic become kind of a living dynamic in the same way that, you know, the best performances I've been at uh, are really living dynamics. Even movies, you go to a movie and it's so good that you just feel like you're part of a conversation, you're so drawn into it. Uh, for me, when I've been to concerts here, uh, I get that same feel like I'm, you know, sort of blurring this boundary or, or the boundaries being blurred between the stage and the seats that I'm sitting in and I'm just like directly connecting with this uh, performer. And so for me to, to, to kind of channel that or to let that energy guide my teaching uh, has just been 
you know, privilege and, and, and really just fun. From my perspective as an instructor, I've seen really two big ways in which this uh, pandemic has affected my students and really two big needs that they have. The first one is just a need for information and a need for somebody in a position of authority or credibility to just look at them in their situation and say like, I really care about what you're going through and it's, it's concerning to me and I wanna support you. And I think uh, for a lot of my students, it's a ter objectively terrifying situation to be in. But for a lot of my students, and I ask them this, I say like, are you getting what you need? Do you get the information that you need? Uh, and a lot of them uh, really thankfully are reporting, yeah, they are. Um, of course, you know, this is not the case across the board, but a lot of them are saying, yeah, I, I, I can, you know, go to this particular adult and I know that they're gonna tell me sort of what I need to do or what information I need to have. So for me, that's uh, really, um, just a reason for hope and optimism in, in sort of the, the midst of the pandemic. The other thing I've noticed with my students behaviorally and otherwise is that they are so receptive and so willing to make huge sacrifices to be in school, to be in class. Of course, like, you know, maybe not across the board or maybe there's a tiny percentage of, of students who feel differently. I have only encountered students who are willing to do whatever it takes to get an education. And I've even posed that to them as a philosophical question. Uh, you know, the question being, what is a university or what is a college class if it's not a place that you go to and sit in the same spot every time and sort of a routine that you get into? What is a college community if it's the sort of thing that can survive a shift to an online mode, a shift back to like an in-person mode, maybe like we're doing it by webinar at some point, but we're, we're continually sort of engaged in this particular activity. And I think my students have really good thoughts on this, really good answers, uh, really sophisticated answers. You know, the, this education, this is the thing that they're pursuing and that they're willing, again, to make massive sacrifices to do. Um, there's not sort of the opportunities that there were in the pre-COVID world for any of us, for students in particular. Um, but what I see is I see students who appreciate that situation. They know it's a hard thing to do and they're willing to do it. And, and for me, I mean, that's just amazing, you know, every day to see those students come into my class or to log into the Zoom and to be ready to learn and to value that experience of learning. Uh, it's just blown me away. So if I had to sum up the whole experience of coming back to school, shifting online, coming back to school, dealing with all the particularities of the pandemic, et cetera, if I had to sum up that experience from my perspective as an instructor, I would say the one word I would use is community. And here's why. Uh, for me, the different modalities and the way that we have to change between them has helped me reconceptualize what the university community is and what the community between me and my students can be. I had one student a few weeks ago, we were talking about an issue kind of related to this, you know, where it's like, we're now online, does this change anything? Or, you know, should we just quit? Should we just give up? Should we make things easier? What should we do? And she said, she's from a military family and they moved constantly. And she said, at first it was really distressing to me because I thought a home was a place you stayed in forever. She said, over time, my family conceived of home in a more resilient way so that we had a home wherever our family was. And there were other external elements like, yeah, there's a house and there's, you know, these objects or whatever, but it was arranged in a particular way. So to me, that sort of just was, you know, a shift in my thinking. And I started thinking, you know, if a home can be a thing that can survive these different disruptions and changes, you know, for a student. Why can't a class, why can't a university community be a thing that even though we're all striving for it to look a particular way, we want to be physically located in space in a particular way. It's this sort of thing that can survive those transitions and that whatever gets thrown at us, whatever externalities are out there, we still have this relationship with each other, with our students, with the faculty, with the staff, uh, and that is the thing that we go back to as the Notre Dame community.